the challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> The Wonder Dog King, swiftest and strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the new Northwest country, where the greed for wealth and power led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog king met that challenge, and justice ruled triumphant. When Mike Allison lost his life in a blizzard as he made his way along one of the Yukon's treacherous trails, his daughter Kate took over the management of the Malamute Cafe in Last Chance. And she managed it well, because Kate was the sort of woman who did everything well. It was early afternoon. A sharp wind swept down the snow-covered street of the town as Dennis Phillips stood talking to Kate in front of her cabin. Well, Denny, I guess you'll be setting off on another of those wild goose chases of yours soon. <laughs> so that's what you call prospecting. Why don't you settle down here in last chance? There's a pile of money right in this town for anybody that knows how to get it. Oh, I've never wanted to settle down in one place. Denny, I... I've never said this to anybody, but... I'll make you a partner in the Malamute Cafe. If you'll stay here. You'll make more money in the cafe than you could dig out of the ground in a year. You and me could... What are you looking at? That man Sergeant Preston's talking to. Well, must be a newcomer. Yeah. That girl standing with him must be the old man's daughter. You're, uh, not listening to what I was saying, Denny. Huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I guess I didn't hear you. I'm sorry, Kate. What were you saying? Several months passed, and in the Malamute Cafe, Kate Allison sat at a table at the far end of the crowded room, her hands restlessly toying with the glass in front of her while she listened to a well-dressed man. You know, Kate, I'd feel mighty sorry for anybody who'd play you for a sack. You can bet your bottom dollar nobody will ever play me for a sack. Not even Dennis Phillips? Not even Dennis Phillips. I don't know why I ain't had you run out of town, you cheap gambler. I'll tell you why, baby. Because you and me are too much alike. We understand each other. I am a gambler. And I'll make you a bet that I can tell what's on your mind right now. Why, you... You're planning a way to bring Dennis Phillips going back to you on his knees. But you're wasting your time. Those two are in love. Love? <coughs> oh, yeah, miss me, Kate. You better practice up. Your aim's pretty bad. Get out of here. Get out, you hear? I'll show you what I can do. You'll regret the day he ever laid eyes on that girl. Get out! A week later in the cafe, Kate Allison smiled to herself as she listened to Dennis Phillips. For it seemed as if he had come crawling back. Well, I'm glad for you, Denny. I'll stake you to whatever you need. Well, that's mighty generous of you. And you won't be sorry. You're interested in making money, and I can promise you you'll get back ten times now, more. Now, wait a minute. I'm interested in making money, yes. But I'm interested in you for personal reasons, Denny. Now, it'll mean a lot to me, the strike. Once the claim really starts turning up pay dirt, Sally and me will get married. That's why I'm so anxious. You'll get married? But you knew, Kate. No. I didn't know that. But I do know this, Mr. Phillips. You're not getting married on my money. What? Go on. See if you can find anybody else in town with gold to throw away. You, uh, you should have given the kid a chance, Kate. What are you doing here? Oh, I was buying a drink at the bar. You don't turn down cash customers, do you? At least you didn't when I was working here. I, um, uh, heard your conversation. I'm not interested in your remarks. You will be when you hear what I have to say. What's it worth to you if I break out that little love affair you don't approve of? What do you mean? Just what I said. Oh, I... I'm not saying how I'll do it. 
but it ought to be worth a partnership in the Malamute. You're crazy. I don't have to do business with people like you yet. All right. Just forget I mentioned it. Wait. What have you got in mind? The next day, Clark Peters talked to Sally Morris. It certainly is too bad Denny can't get anybody to stake him, Miss Morris. He talked yesterday as if he knew someone who would. Kate Allison was going to stake him. That is, she was until she heard that if he struck it rich, you two would get married. She'd give him the money in a minute if it weren't for that. She... she's in love with Denny? Oh, I guess she thinks she is. But then, he must mean more to you than the claim. And you'll probably marry him even if it doesn't work out. Too bad, though, that he has to be disappointed. You mean it's because of me he can't get the money he needs to work the claim? Mm, that's about the size of it, Miss Morris. It's you or his future, most likely. From what I've heard of this secret strike of his, it's really a good one. Uh, I see. Well, thank you for telling me. Not at all, ma'am. I'm interested in Dennis's claim myself. Mighty interested. It was several weeks later. Sergeant Preston found Dennis Phillips sitting at a table in the Malamute Cafe, a half-empty bottle of whiskey in front of him. The great dog King followed close at Preston's heels. And as the Mountie sat down, King settled himself at his master's feet. I never expected to find you here, Dennis. What about Sally? She'd hardly approve of your drinking. <sighs> Sally don't care what I do. She's gone. Father said she went off to visit some friends. He made him promise he wouldn't even tell me where. That's no use. Without Sally, I don't care about the claim. I don't care about nothing. Is Dennis talking about his claim again, Sergeant? Hello, Clark. Oh, he'll talk about it all right. Tell you everything except where it is. I think it's just a pipe dream myself. Pipe dream? Why, uh, yo, it's Dennis, morning. I... Come on outside. I want to talk to you. Once outside in the cold Yukon air, the two men walked together for nearly 30 minutes. The Mountie listened, and then Dennis listened, his mind clearing as he heard the Mountie's words. You've told me where your claim is, and I believe you that it's a rich one. I want you to go out there and start to work at once. Leave the rest to me. While Sergeant Preston talked to Sam Morris, Sally's father, Dennis prepared to mush along the trail toward his secret claim. He'd told Kate of his plans and of his talk with the policeman. And when he went to his cabin to pack his sled, she turned furiously to Clark Peters. You, you were going to break up his affair with Sally Morris. A fine job you've done. If I know Preston, once he's heard the kid's story, he'll bring Sally back to last chance. And she'll be here in time for the happy ending. Oh, what a fool I was to listen to you. You played your game and lost. But I haven't. I'm going after Phillips. Your what? I'm going after him. I've always been curious to know whether or not that claim of his is worth anything. If it is, you can bet I'm going to be in on the payoff. It was a few days later... Clark Peters had bided his time after he followed Dennis to his claim. He had watched from a safe distance while the young man set up a temporary camp and began work. Then, boldly, he confronted him. I'll hand it to you, Dennis. You were on the level when you said this was a rich strike. Put that gun down. Don't worry, I'll put it down when I'm ready. I'm not going to shoot you, my friend. That'd be too obvious. A blow on the head. I'll tie your hands and feet. We'll throw you on a sled and then... You won't get away with it. You see this bottle? That's wolf bait. I'll pour some of it on your clothing. And as far as anybody will know, you'll have met with an unfortunate accident. Why, well, you conniving tin horn. I'll show you you can't get oh, away no, with you it. No, you don't. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> That's only the beginning, Dennis. Now to get some rope. <laughs> As Clark Peters halted his sled a short time later, 
He had no idea Sergeant Preston's team was approaching, or that the dog King, running far ahead of his master's pack, even at that moment paused in his tracks as he caught two cents, one familiar and the other unknown to him. The air was sharp and exhilarating, and King raced forward. A few minutes passed, and he saw the two men. The one the great dog didn't recognize was dragging Sergeant Preston's friend. For a moment, King didn't understand the situation. And then he saw why his master's friend couldn't walk. His feet were tied. Go on, groan, Philip. You'll be screaming once you hear the wolves. Now, where'd that dog come from? Why, he's... But Clark Peters had no more time to wonder from where King had appeared. He backed away from the dog who came toward him. Instantly, King seemed to be on all sides of him, cutting off his skin. As the dog leaped at him, catching the man's mackin on his teeth, Clark's one thought was to get to his sled. Already, the wolves had caught the scent of the man. The wolves? I've got to get out of here. Get away from me, I'm not. If I hadn't left my gun in Philip's tent, I'd... Oh, I've got to get to my sled. King turned toward the man who lay helpless in the snow. And as he did, Clark Peters, in his hurry to reach the sled that was waiting for him, slipped and fell. And falling, the bottle he carried in the pocket of his mackinaw broke. But Peters thinking to evade the dog that had descended on him like a whirlwind, got up and rushed on. King set to work chewing the ropes that bound Dennis Phillips' hands. Oh, you're oh. Dennis. Dennis. Oh, Danny. Darling, what happened? Miss Clark. Are, are you all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. But I sure would have been wolf meat if it hadn't been for you. I did hear them a moment ago, but they seemed to have gone on. Sergeant, how come Sally's here? I mean, if she... Oh, Danny, I told the sergeant about Clark coming to tell me about your claim. I was only trying to fix things for you so you'd be able to get grub staked and... I got grub staked, all right. When you left town, Kate said that she... Wait a minute. Clark went to see you. Sergeant, wait till I tell you. Yes, you'd better tell me in fast. How'd you happen to be tied hand and foot here? All we saw was King chewing those ropes through. Dennis Phillips told his story quickly of how Clark Peters had held a gun on him and threatened to make wolf meat of him. He told of King's efforts to drive off the gambler. And as Preston heard the details... He nodded grimly. Good work, King, old boy. But right now, there's another job for you. We'll follow Peter's tracks. Get the dogs up. The wolves had followed Clark Peter's sled, coming closer inch by inch to the man who was unarmed. Their teeth bared, giving voice to the terrifying cry that meant but one thing, death. When he heard the shots that scattered the frenzied wolf packs around him, he could hardly believe his ears. Save me! Save me! Oh, King! Oh, you huskies! Hold your dogs, Peters! Oh, oh, you oh, thank heaven. You can't know how awful it was. I, 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 I had no gun. I've never known them to attack anyone in daylight before. Think again, Clark. They would have got me in broad daylight if you'd had your way. You're under arrest for attempted manslaughter, Peters. What? What's that on your Mackinac? What? What? Wolf bait? What? That was why they followed me. The bottle broke in my pocket. Oh, how horrible. And to think, Denny, you... You might have now been... Now, don't think about it, honey. We have a lot more pleasant things to talk about. But, Sergeant, if it hadn't been for King, I hate to think of what... Yes, King, old boy. The case is closed. These copyrighted dramas originate in the studios of WXYZ Detroit. And all characters, names, places, and incidents used are fictitious. They are sent to you each week at the same time. Jack McCarthy speaking.